Welcome back everyone. Today we'll be considering internal forces in frames. We'll be doing an example problem of a determinant frame where we'll draw the axial shear and moment diagrams for our columns and a beam. Our problem for today will be this simple frame. It's going to be 15 feet high and 12 feet long. We have a distributed load and two point loads. The point loads are both located at point C. The first thing that we'll do in this example is we want to find our reaction forces. And after we do that, we will then solve for our internal forces in both columns and the beam. So for this problem, we have three reactions. We have a force here at A, and I'll call that A in the Y direction. And we'll have two forces here at the pin. We'll have D in the Y direction and D in the X direction. So let's start off by finding our force in the X direction, because all we'll need for that is our sum of forces X is equal to zero, which tells me that DX minus 1.8 kips is equal to zero. So again, in the X direction, I have a 1.8 kip going to the left and DX going to the right. So that just means DX is equal to 1.8 kips. Next, let's use a sum of moments and I'll take my moments about point A is equal to zero and I'll use this to solve for DY in this case. So if I look at all my moments, I have my distributed load, that's going to be causing a clockwise moment. So that's going to be negative. The load is two kips per foot. It's applied over a distance of eight feet long and the moment arm is four feet. And then I also have a concentrated load of 1.25 kips with a moment arm of 12 feet. It's a negative moment because again, that's turning my frame clockwise about point A. I have a positive moment caused by my 1.8 kip force, and that has a moment arm of 15 feet. And finally, my last unknown is dy, so I'll have plus dy times the moment arm of 12 feet is equal to zero. We can solve that equation for dy is equal to 4.33 kips. Now finally, let's consider sum of forces in the y direction to finish this problem off. I'll have an ay plus dy minus two kips per foot applied over eight feet long, and then minus a 1.25 kips, and all that's equal to zero. And therefore, a y is equal to 12.92 kips. Given these reaction forces, we can find the internal forces for each of the members, for the columns and the beams separately. So we'll break this up into three separate free body diagrams. I'll be looking at the column here, the beam separately, and then the column over here. The two point loads at location C, I'm going to arbitrarily say one of them is acting on this free body diagram and the other one is acting on my column to the right. Either way you split that up, it technically works out, but you can't have that force on both free body diagrams, so I've chosen this layout. Now the first thing that we'll want to do is we'll want to define our coordinate system for each of the columns and beams. Now for beams, it's usually relatively obvious. We would define a coordinate system going positive to the right, and therefore up is going to be my y direction, so we'll have an x and a y direction. Now for the columns, we're going to do a similar thing, but we have to make sure we have an orthogonal and right-handed coordinate system. So for my column AB, I'll say up is the positive x direction, and out to the left is positive y. Finally, for my last column, I'm going to switch this up a bit. I will say that the positive x direction is down, and therefore my positive y direction here has to go to the right. So let's consider each of our free body diagrams. I'm going to start with column AB here on the left, and we'll have a reaction force here at A upwards. It's 12.92 kips. There's no other external forcing on that point, and I will, just to remind us, draw the coordinate system, X and Y, for this column. Now I'll go down the line and I'll derive my axial shear and moment diagrams. So starting with the axial diagram, We'll begin at the end A, where my coordinate system starts, and we always start at zero. And then we notice that we have a force acting in the positive direction. It's positive because my X is going up of 12.92 kips. Now the axial force diagram will always change your sign. So therefore we're going to go down by 12.92 kips. And there's no other axial force along the length, so that is constant. And therefore, I'm going to end this diagram at 12.92 kips. Now, this is negative. You'll notice how I drew my axes here. My axes are going to be positive in this positive y direction. So given that this is negative, this is a compressive uh, 
stress inside that column. A compressive stress at end B is going to be a force acting down into the column because a positive one would be acting out from that point. And so because it's a negative 12.92 at the end, I have, my end force is 12.92 kips acting down into the column. Now for my shear diagram, I notice I have no load in the Y direction. So the shear diagram is just a solid zero. So I'll just put a zero there. There is no shear going on in this column and therefore moment, there are no concentrated moments and there's no shear. So your moment is also zero. So therefore at end B, my internal forces are just the axial force 12.92 kips in compression. So now let's move on to our next free body diagram. Let's look at BC. Now we do have internal forces at this location right here. And we had noticed that at the end of column AB, I had a force acting down of 12.92 kips. So that force must be acting equal and opposite on my free body diagram BC. So I'll have an upward force of 12.92 kips here. And there's no other force because we have no shear or moment in this column. Now my internal forces at side C, I don't know yet, but I will get them from the end point of my axial shear and moment diagrams. So let's start this one with axial. We see there's nothing going on in the X direction. So therefore there is no axial force whatsoever in this beam. So that means we get to skip to shear. At the shear, we'll start at zero as always. And I see I have an upward force of 12.92 kips. Shear diagrams always go in the same direction as your force. So that means we'll start this diagram at a positive 12.92 kips. Next, I see I have a distributed load of two kips per foot down, which means I'm going to have a slope of negative two on my shear diagram. So it's going to go down like that. We'll label the slope. That slope is again a negative two kips per foot because that's my distributed load. The end point of this is going to be a negative 3.08 kips. And if we check the triangles um, for the slope, we'll find that this distance here is 6.458 feet. And therefore this distance is eight minus that. So it's 1.542 feet. Along my next section from eight to 12 feet here, I notice that I have no load, therefore my shear is constant. So it's just going to continue out there. And at the final point, I have a downward force of 1.25 kips. So that will cause a jump in my shear diagram downwards by 1.25 kips. So this new value is negative 4.33 kips. Lastly, we'll do the moment diagram. We see that we have no concentrated moments on this diagram, so we don't have to deal with that, but we do have to find the area under our shear. So here we have three areas that we need to calculate. So for this triangle here, for example, it's going to be one half times the height, which is 12.92 times the base, which is 6.458. And therefore that area is a 41.71. Next, we have another triangle right here. The height of that triangle is 3.08 and the base is 1.542 and therefore one half times base times height gives us an area of negative 2.3767. And I'll give that a negative area because it is underneath my X axis and it's going to reduce my moment diagram. Lastly, I have a rectangle right here. It is four feet long and it has a height of negative 3.08. And so therefore this area is a negative 12.33. Now moving over to my moment diagram, I start at zero as always, and I'm going to increase to the peak right here. And that peak is going to be 41.71. And that peak occurs at the point of zero shear. So I'll draw my parabola collect connecting those. From here on, I have a negative area of negative 2.3767. So that's going to take my diagram down to a 39.33 followed by a linear branch, linear because I have a constant slope of negative 3.08. And that will take us to the end of the diagram where that is going to be a 27. Now looking at my axial shear and moment diagrams, I can find out what my internal forces are at end C. So I have no axial force because there's nothing going on there. I have a shear force of negative 4.33 kips and I have a moment of positive 27 kip feet. 
So adding those, there's no axial force, so there's no force in the X direction. There is a negative shear on this positive face. A negative shear is an upward force of 4.33 kips. And then there's a moment on the positive face of a beam. The moment that's positive is counterclockwise, so it's 27 kip feet at that end. Moving on to the final step, if I look at column CD, I'll draw my coordinate system. In here, I said X was going to be down, and because this is a right-handed coordinate system, Y is going to go to the right. And I do have internal forces at that location. So again, if I look at my beam from B to C, we found that we had a force of 4.33 kips up, and we had a moment of 27 kip feet acting counterclockwise. So those have to get reversed when they're applied to the top of C. So therefore I'm going to have a downward force of 4.33 kips, and I'll have a clockwise moment of 27 kip feet, and there's no horizontal load because there was no axial force in this beam. I will, however, need to label my reaction forces down here at point D. So that was 4.33 kips up and 1.8 kips to the right. We'll start by looking at our axial diagram. We'll start at zero as we always do, and then we'll immediately see that we have a force of 4.33 kips acting down. Now, down in this diagram is in the positive X direction. So that is a positive load, and therefore it decreases my axial diagram. So remember, the axial diagram always switches your sign. So therefore, I'm going to go down from zero to a negative 4.33 kips. There is no other load on the um, X direction, where X is the local X direction here, until I get to the end where I have a 4.33 acting up, that's going to increase my diagram back up to zero. So we see this is all negative, so I'm gonna put a C in there for compressive. Also note that now that I'm at the end of my structure, so I've hit a pin, my diagram has come back to zero, and that is a good check on your solution. Your diagrams will always come back to zero when you hit your boundary conditions or the end of your structure. Now let's do the same thing for shear. So I start at zero shear, and I do see I have a point load of 1.8 kips acting right there. For your shear diagram, your diagram will move in the same direction as the load, so therefore it's going to go down by 1.8 kips, and this is negative, and there's no other loads in that direction until I get to the end and it comes back up by 1.8 kips back to zero. Now this is technically a negative area, so put a negative sign in there. Now if I calculate the area under the shear diagram, it's all a negative area and it's negative 1.8 kips times the height, which is 15 feet. So this is a negative 27. And again, notice that we closed off our shear diagram. So we ended at zero at the end of our structure. So that's good. And that's a good check that we did this correctly and we have the right reaction forces. Next, let's look at moment. So we start at zero as usual. And I see I have a concentrated moment at that end of 27 kip feet that's acting clockwise. Now, concentrated moments, we always flip the sign when going to our moment diagram. So a clockwise, which is normally a negative moment, will go positive in my moment diagram. So I'm going to go up to 27 kip feet. And I can see I have an area of negative 27, which is perfect. That's gonna take me back to zero. So I found my internal forces for both my columns and my beam. So let's summarize. Oftentimes, all of our diagrams will be drawn on the structure itself. That's a great way of presenting your results and we can see everything very visually. And it's especially meaningful for the moment diagram. So this is a very common practice to do. Now for the axial diagram, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure I put my sign in there because it's very easy to forget what's kind of happening with that. So in this column right here, I'm going to draw my axial diagram. This we found was 12.92 kips. And I'm gonna put a C in there because that's compressive. Likewise, I had zero axial force along the beam. Moving on to the last column, my axial diagram looked like this, and it was a quantity of 4.33 kips. Now, this looks like I've drawn it on the opposite side of my column versus this one. However, from before, I remember that this was actually negative. It was in compression, so that's why it's very important to label this as C. So sometimes the direction of your axial diagrams can get confused. And the reason that happened in this case is because I defined X as up in one of my columns and as down in the other column. 
So most importantly, we'll just have to remember that these are in compression. Moving on to shear, we had a shear of zero in this column over here. And for the beam, I had a diagram that looked like this, had a little step down there, and this was 12.92 kips and a negative 3.08 kips. And finally, a negative 4.33 kips at the base. Now for shear, sign doesn't usually matter in design. So most of the time we'll be interested in whatever the maximum shear is for this case, which would be the 12.92 kips. Finally, drawing this for my column, I see that the column is going to have a constant shear along the entire length of negative 1.8 kips. Now recall that we had zero moment in this column. And for the beam, we had a moment diagram that was a parabola here. And then we had a linear branch ending it off. The peak of my moment diagram was equal to 41.71 kip feet. And it ended at 27 kip feet at this end. In my final column, I noticed that I had a moment again of 27 kip feet at that location. And then it comes down to zero at the end. Now this way of drawing moment diagrams is very handy and it turns out it doesn't matter what your XY convention is for each of the beams or columns. When you have a moment diagram, we can write it directly on the beam or column and the side that the moment diagram is on is the side that's in, in compression. So this top side is in compression and the bottom will be in tension here. And likewise on this column, this outside will be in compression and the inside will be in tension. And obviously on my other column, there's only the axial force there, so that's all I would have to design for. And that is how we find axial shear and moment diagrams for frames. We can always look at more complex examples, so I'll follow it up with another example where we look at some more complex loading cases. I hope you stick around for that, and I hope you learned something from this video. Please subscribe. I'll see you next time.